Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. So there is a lot of confusion when it comes to optimal vitamin D levels. Take a look at this comment on one of my vitamin D videos. Beauty Addict 08 writes, My doctor told me last week that my vitamin D levels were 96, which I was really pleased with as the doctor said it was in the normal range. On having access to my records, I realized that the UK measures the levels in N mol per liter rather than nanograms per milliliter. Therefore, my level was 96 N mol per liter, which in effect is only 38 nanograms per milliliter. I take 3000 IUs of vitamin D every day with K2. I'm a dark skinned lady and now I'm thinking I need to increase my vitamin D supplementation. It feels to me that doctors are happy with blood level readings that are adequate or sufficient. Shouldn't the aim be to reach optimal levels? Thanks Beauty Addict 08 for highlighting the difference between nmol per liter and nanogram per milliliter. I have seen plenty of medical guidelines and articles where authors routinely mix these two units. So I found a handy website that allows you to convert back and forth between nmol per liter and nanogram per milliliter. I will link it in the video description below. So when I plug your vitamin D serum level of 96 nmol per liter in this conversion tool, I get 38.4 nanogram per milliliter. In my opinion, your number is okay, but it's not great. So take for example, my vitamin D serum level, which is now 66 nanogram per milliliter. According to my doctor, this is an optimal value. By the way, when we talk about vitamin D serum level, we are referring to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now this is important because there are a couple of vitamin D tests. So make sure that uh, your vitamin D test is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. This is the vitamin D that is in your blood circulation and when needed, your kidneys and your liver will convert it into the active form of vitamin D. Now there is a test which will measure the active form of vitamin D but do not get that test done. It will cost you more money and that test is not really useful. So remember, get the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test when you go to your doctor. Now the problem with vitamin D guideline is that it's all over the place. There are three separate institutes and none of them agree on a single optimal vitamin D level. So the first one is IOM, which stands for Institute of Medicine. They are also known as the National Academy of Medicine or NAM. So according to NAM, vitamin D serum levels below 12 nanogram per milliliter, that's considered as deficient. Serum levels between 12 to 20 nanogram per milliliter, that's considered insufficient for most people. And serum levels of 20 nanogram per milliliter or higher, that's considered as sufficient for most individuals according to NAM. Now in my opinion and based on the research that I have done, NAM's guidelines are horribly outdated. It's based on more than a century old research that was conducted on infants who were suffering from rickets. Now rickets is a skeletal disorder which is characterized by softening and weakening of bones in mostly children and sometimes in adults. The history of rickets and its connection to vitamin D deficiency, it's a fascinating story. So in the 17th century, scientists and physicians, they began to speculate about the role of sunlight in preventing rickets in children. Some noted that children who spend more time outdoors or who received regular sunlight exposure, they seem to be less prone to rickets. But the exact connection was not understood at this time. By the 18th century, there was growing awareness that diet might be linked to rickets. It was observed that children from poor families who had nutrient deficient diets, they were more likely to develop this disease. However, the precise dietary factor responsible for the condition, it remained a mystery. So one of the key breakthroughs, it came in the 19th century when a British surgeon suggested that cod liver oil might have a beneficial effect on children who had rickets. He recommended its use for treating the disease in the early 1820s. 
But it was not until the early 20th century when the role of vitamin D in preventing rickets took a significant step forward. By 1920, scientists found out that exposure to ultraviolet light or dietary factors could prevent and cure rickets. They coined the term vitamin D to describe this mysterious factor. Subsequent research in the early 20th century revealed that exposure to UVB or the ultraviolet light in the sunlight that allowed the skin to produce vitamin D. So it was after all our skin which was uh, synthesizing vitamin D. This explained why sunlight exposure was effective in preventing and treating rickets in children. Scientists came to the conclusion that a vitamin D serum level of 20 nanogram per milliliter was sufficient to maintain healthy bones. But these scientists did not know about the other benefits of vitamin D. Latest research now shows that vitamin D plays a crucial role not just in bone health but also cancer prevention, depression, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, weight loss, multiple sclerosis and various autoimmune disorders and conditions like Hashimoto's. But in order to reap all these benefits, one needs a higher vitamin D serum level in their blood which means the National Academy of Medicine's vitamin D guidelines are outdated. So let's take a look at the recommendation from the endocrine society who suggest a much higher vitamin D serum level. According to them, a serum level 20 nanogram per milliliter that is considered deficient. And this is in direct contradiction with IOM's recommendation because remember they said that 20 nanogram per milliliter that's sufficient for individuals. Next, endocrine society recommends that a serum level between 21 and 29 nanogram per milliliter that is still in sufficient. So while technically you are not deficient if you have this level, your vitamin D levels are insufficient and they are not optimal. So the optimal value according to endocrine society is 30 nanogram per milliliter or higher. This is the recommendation that most doctors here in the US have started following. When I was first diagnosed with my vitamin D deficiency, my levels were around 13 nanograms per milliliter. My first doctor advised me to take 1000 IUs of vitamin D supplementation to raise my level to about 30 nanograms per milliliter. So I trusted my doctor and I did that. But my symptoms of vitamin D deficiency, which was chronic fatigue and mental fogginess, that still persisted. Only when I fired my first doctor and I found someone better did my symptoms start improving. So now I have been taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 supplementation along with 100 mcg of vitamin K2 in the form of MK7. I also take about 250 milligrams of magnesium glycinate and the reason I take these three vitamins is because there is plenty of research that points to the complementary nature of vitamin D3, vitamin K2 and magnesium. While vitamin D3 enhances calcium absorption, vitamin K2 ensures that the absorbed calcium is directed to the bones and to the teeth. And magnesium is needed to move vitamin D around in the blood and to activate it. So you need to take all three of these supplements if you want to have a nice synergy between these three vitamins and minerals. Finally, let's talk about the guidelines from Vitamin D Council, which is a non-profit organization that promotes awareness and education about vitamin D. Their guidelines are most up-to-date with the latest vitamin D research. So according to them, a vitamin D serum level below 40 nanograms per milliliter, that is considered deficient. Serum levels between 40 and 80 nanograms per milliliter is typically considered sufficient for most individuals. But going above 80 nanograms per milliliter milliliter that has no measurable benefits, so one should avoid it. So as you can see, Vitamin D Council's recommendation is significantly more aggressive than the Institute of Medicine and the Endocrine Society. Remember, Institute of Medicine was saying that 20 nanograms per milliliter is good enough. Whereas the Vitamin D Council is saying that anything below 40 nanograms per milliliter, that is insufficient. So if you are wondering how much vitamin D supplementation you need to maintain this healthy level of vitamin D, then the answer I'm afraid is it depends. 
So if you are a dark skin colored person like me, then you need a higher dosage. If you suffer from autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto, then you need a higher dosage. If you are old, then you need a higher dosage. So the best option is to first get a vitamin D test and see what your vitamin D serum level is. Then talk to your doctor and figure out the right dosage for your case. Obviously, I'm assuming that your doctor is not a dumbass because if they are, then you need to fire them and find a better doctor. Your goal should be to bring your vitamin D serum level to about 60 to 65 nanogram per milliliter. Now, if you're interested in learning more about vitamin D, then check out my ebook. This book chronicles my three year journey of going from being vitamin D deficient to now maintaining a healthy and robust vitamin D serum level. During these years, I researched about vitamin D like a mad scientist. I read every medical journal and every article that I could find. And I took all that knowledge and I distilled it down into this book. So if you are interested, check out my book. It's linked in the video description below. Next, why don't you watch this video over here? It's a vitamin D video and I promise you will find it very useful. So go ahead and click over here and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.